Hi, I'm Jill Santiago, Director of the Center for Social Justice and Human Understanding at Suffolk County Community College. By Design, The History of Oppression on Long Island is a documentary series focused on various forms of persecution, bias, and injustice which exist here. Today we're focusing on the history of disability rights, individuals who have shaped legislation, and what the state of the movement is today. To help explore these issues, I'm talking with two experts in the field from the Viscardi Center. Kim Brussel, Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Marketing, and CEO and President Dr. Chris Rosa. The mission of the Viscardi Center is to educate, employ, and empower children and adults with disabilities. Thank you, Jill. Honor to have you here. Thank you. So the Viscardi Center is a really remarkable place. Um, before my visit here, I was looking around on your website a little bit, and I found myself on a page called Dr. Chris's Questions, and the question posed to students was, what makes you proud to be a Henry Viscardi School student? And the, the responses were really, really beautiful. Um, there's a feeling of acceptance here. We're all comfortable here. HVS has made me a better person because it has made me smarter and taught me to advocate for myself. Um, and it seems to me that that's really a testimony to the culture of this school and must speak to who Henry Viscardi was. So to get started, I would love to know who is Henry Viscardi and could you tell us about him? No, thank you. And thank you for the affirmation uh, of those observations by a student, by our students. I, I think that they are reflecting our abiding commitment to disability culture, mm -hmm. which is so affirming of their individual identities. And I think those core values are rooted in the legacy of our founder, Dr. Henry Viscardi, who was really a precursor to the modern disability rights movement. And my friend Kim uh, is really a self-studied Dr. Viscardi historian. <laughs> she tells a really good narrative about who he was. Kim. Thank you, Chris. So Dr. Viscardi, he was really a true entrepreneur and a trailblazer for you know, his time period. And he really set out to show that individuals with disabilities could be active participants in our communities, that could, they could be productive, skilled employees, et cetera. And what he created here at the Viscardi Center really is a model for the world. So just to give you a little bit of a snapshot, you know, when he started our organization in 1952, he started it with 57 people who others thought were unemployable. And we were doing assembly work and factory work for the Department of Defense and GE and IBM and Grumman. And within that first year that he operated here, he, had, he sold $200,000 worth of goods. He finished the first year with a $48,000 profit. And within mm -hmm. five years, he had over 300 employees and became one of the first businesses in the United States that was employed primarily by individuals with disabilities. And they had a million dollars in sales and a shiny new plant, which is where we are here today. Wow, that's incredible. And, and I think that his work is so striking and so resonant for us here because he himself was a person with a disability when access opportunity uh, for individuals with disabilities was virtually non-existent. He mm -hmm. was born in 1916 um, with a condition that uh, allowed him to have um, underdeveloped lower limbs. And so um, he was really an individual with a very significant disability who through the, sure, the sheer force of his will and the strength of his convictions um, really set out to create opportunity for individuals with disabilities like himself. That's incredible. So somebody that really didn't have much to work with. He wasn't a celebrity, wasn't you know, a wealthy individual, just had the passion to help others. Right. And, and that's all, this is the result of all of that. Absolutely. So it's incredible. So can you tell me a little bit about the students that you serve today? Sure. At our Henry Viscardi School, um, we're really proud of the diverse, talented, vibrant kids that we serve here. Um, they're all kids with very significant levels of physical disability and underlying medical conditions that lead to medical vulnerability. Um, Kim and I and everybody here at Viscardi uh, hold inclusion as our most important core value. Mm -hmm. And we believe that kids with disabilities ought to be educated in the most inclusive setting. For most kids with disabilities, that will be 
in their district school, in their neighborhood school. Sure. Um, but for some kids, the resources are just not available because mm. of the intensity of support that they need. And that's where the Viscardi School comes in. We, we meet that need for kids with very significant levels of physical disability. And the anchor of, of our instructional model, not only um, really brilliant and dedicated e educators and professionals who give students a very rigorous uh, course of study. Um, all of our students pursue uh, uh, Regents curricula uh, mm -hmm. here at the Viscardi School. Um, but it's also anchored by the underlying support that they get through our medical suite. Maybe, Kim, mm -hmm. you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So we have a medical suite that's staffed by several nurses, and we also have a doctor on call. And it's basically, you know, it's not your general school nurse where you go in with a little headache or you right. have a temperature. We're doing, you know, upwards of 100 procedures. It could be tube feedings, it could be catheterizations, medicine checks, oxygen checks, et cetera. And not only is our staff helping our students with their medical needs, but they're also teaching them how to direct um, as they get older, mm -hmm. you know, other professionals that they have in their life. So we'll teach them to either do the procedure themselves or, or get help with them to direct others. Which is amazing because it, going back to what that student's comment was, um, I learned how to be an advocate mm -hmm. for myself. So it's mm -hmm. empowering them really, Absolutely. you know, to, to help, help themselves. And for these kids, it's really an alternative to homeschooling, mm -hmm. um, which would probably be the only other viable option for them. But here, they're fully included in all aspects of school life. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the most empowering and vibrant ways. Sure. Right. So their socialization, the, the activities that they get is all here. So it's a really holistic Absolutely. approach. We have, you know, after school activities, we have prom, we have graduation. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we were speaking a little bit earlier, Jill, you know, many of our students go on to college, mm -hmm. you know, even Suffolk mm -hmm. Community College. Sure. So it's really nice to see that they're, either they're continuing their education or they're going out into the workforce or into community programs to be active. Henry Viscardi made a tremendous impact, I guess, on Long Island, um, and, but he was really bigger than that. I mean, his mm -hmm. work was even impacted the nation and, and what legislation looked like, and I'm curious if you could talk about that a little bit. Most, most certainly. I mentioned early on that he was a precursor to the modern disability rights movement, and he really uh, stepped into a void when it came to access opportunity and um, basic civil rights for people with disabilities. And many of the, much of the ideological framework that he laid became the basis for key pieces of disability rights legislation that all Americans with disabilities now lean upon uh, in order to make sure that they are able to fully participate in all aspects of American life. So his work to found the um, what is now known as the Henry Viscardi School uh, was founded on the principles that would later become the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which entitles kids with disabilities to a free and appropriate education in the most inclusive setting. Um, and his work on equal access and opportunity to employment are uh, ideological uh, pillars of Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Right. And also, he was a disability advisor to eight U.S. presidents, from wow. FDR all wow. the way to Jimmy Carter. So you can tell, you know, how our national government at a federal level really relied upon his insight. And, and there are organizations around the world that are modeled after what we were doing here. He actually recorded what he was doing on, a, on a, an album and a record, and he sent it out around the world. And there are organizations in Japan and New Zealand, et cetera, that all are, have similar missions to what we're doing so here. So he really made a global he impact. He really did. Yeah. Now, you said he began his work in 1952 mm -hmm. here on Long Island. What did, the disabil what did disability rights look like at that point in history? Uh, at that moment, they were virtually non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there started to become some sense of urgency around greater inclusion because of the large number of military veterans who returned from service with significant disabilities. Um, but beyond that, there was really no expectation that uh, kids and adults with disabilities 
would be included, uh, either in education or in the workforce. And um, that was the, the impetus behind Dr. Viscardi's work. Kim already spoke about the path-breaking approach to creating competitive employment opportunity for people with disabilities through his founding of Abilities Incorporated in West Hempstead. Um, and the Henry Viscardi School, the first class, was, l was literally Dr. Viscardi uh, traveling around Long Island seeking out kids who had been excluded from education from their community schools and welcom welcoming him, them to this bold new educational enterprise that uh, was then the Human Resources Center, the Human Resources School, which is now the school named in his honor. It's incredible. So it's really been changing lives. It's been changing lives since, mm -hmm. since then. Yeah. Um, it seems like his passion was really empowerment for students and, and equity through education and through opportunity. And unfortunately, we know that often the individuals who need support services most don't have access to them. And that's really where oppression comes into this conversation. Um, and, and the lack of resources, the lack of funds, um, and really just the lack of advocates or advocacy for individuals with disabilities. And I'm wondering if you would talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, when it comes to oppression, um, I think that it was fair to say that in Dr. Viscardi's day, um, it was not in any way veiled or hidden. Um, mm. uh, Dr. Viscardi spoke about his difficulties actually getting um, his, his school and his center situated in our neighborhood. There was definitely a not in my backyard uh, mm -hmm. reaction mm -hmm. to the notion that he would start this bold new enterprise here on Long Island. Um, he was a ferocious advocate and would not take no for an answer. And um, we're grateful for mm -hmm. his, mm -hmm. his unwillingness to yield because it created um, a lifetime, a ge generations of opportunity for people with disabilities. Um, I think the oppression still exists, certainly, um, in the United States. Um, it's, it's veiled and it's more masked by structural uh, mm -hmm. oppression. Mm -hmm. um, you see it embedded in, um, in, in things like um, disincentives to work that are embedded mm -hmm. in benefit systems mm -hmm. that provide resources and supports that people need um, to get out of bed and to get ready for work in the morning, mm -hmm. um, which are tied to, eligibility is tied to asset limits. And that really puts a cap on people with disabilities aspirations to the middle class and beyond. Um, and it's that kind of embedded uh, structural oppression and discrimination that is really the next uh, brave new set of barriers that Americans with disabilities need to traverse in order to fully participate in American life. Yeah, you're, you're really speaking to the next question that I had. In, in many of the chapters of this series by Design, the History of Oppression on Long Island, uh, it seems like we're circling around a lot of the same issues, that of segregation, Long Island being one of the most segregated um, places in our nation, and that of systemic racism. And I'm wondering if there are ways that you see that play out in, when we're thinking about the disabled community. Sure. Um, well, uh, in, as I mentioned early on, we're proud of our legacy at Viscardi to combat isolation and segregation. Um, at the very heart of our, of our founding is the notion that people ought to be included uh, mm -hmm. in educational life, in community life. And so many of our programs and resources are geared to ensure that kids with disabilities uh, are not segregated or isolated, but get to participate um, in an inclusive educational setting alongside their peers. Um, and so much of our career readiness activities are designed to make sure that people with disabilities have the education and training in order to take their rightful place in the new American workforce. Um, so uh, much of our effort and our mission is focused on combating segregation and, and isolation. 
But I think as you, as you were hinting at, you know, Jill, there are certain things that are almost like out of our control when it comes to, you know, policy that mm -hmm. hasn't changed mm -hmm. in so many years as Chris touched upon when, mm -hmm. you know, you have these income levels that are affecting people's benefits that almost is a disincentive to work because they're afraid of losing their benefits or just even accessible transportation to get around. Even when mm -hmm. you look at Long Island, mm -hmm. you know, we've had many uh, individuals who graduate here at the center and they want to participate in different things whether it's higher education or employment or even socially and just the structure of the way transportation is set up sure. where you have to you know you get to the Suffolk County line have to change buses yeah. to get into Nassau County yeah. and those are you know definitely things yeah, that issues of access yeah, that, are, that are major barriers mm -hmm. to people yeah. living their lives in the, in the ways that they want to. Chris I know you spent many years in higher education and Students that are pursuing their education who have disabilities often have a lot to contend with. Um, can you talk about some of these concerns that that population faces? Sure. Um, I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't talk about the progress that we've experienced over the last four decades when it comes to equal access and opportunity in higher education for college students with disabilities. Thanks to civil rights legislation, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Section 504 in particular, and Title II of the ADA, um, now college students with disabilities at Suffolk and all colleges and universities throughout the nation are guaranteed equal access and opportunity to all aspects of college and university life. And the results have, have borne that out. Um, we see that high school students with disabilities are applying to and being accepted at colleges and universities at rates comparable to their peers without disabilities and they're graduating at rates that are comparable to their peers without disabilities so that's really heartening and yes. it's an affirmation to the fact that if you level the playing field that col college students with disabilities can achieve on par with their peers without disabilities mm. Um, where it's disheartening is in post-secondary outcomes. We would hope that a college degree would really transform opportunities for employment mm -hmm. um, for people with disabilities. And what we're finding is that employment rates among college graduates with disabilities still lag behind uh, those of the general population. Mm -hmm. And so we're working really hard uh, to change that narrative. Um, I've been very fortunate to work with my colleague Jen Forney at Suffolk County Community College mm -hmm. and higher ed advocates from throughout the state and through our advocacy and leadership by the state legislature um, there is a funding program enhancing supports and services for college students with disabilities success in post-secondary education um, mm -hmm. and that's going to provide key funding for colleges like Suffolk to augment services that improve college students with disabilities career readiness for example so we'll be able to be very very intentional about making sure that college students are poised for successful transitions to employment mm -hmm. upon graduation and so um, we're very optimistic about the impact that that kind of investment can have that's fantastic so what does the disabilities rights movement look like today? What are, what are some of the big issues that people are working to change legislation and, and things of that nature? Well, uh, we touched on one core issue earlier. It has to do with unleashing the full promise of the Americans with Disabilities Act by beginning to dismantle uh, these oppressive structures um, within disability benefit system, for example that keep people with disabilities from really competing on, on a level playing field for competitive employment. Mm -hmm. um, many people with disabilities rely on Medicaid um, in order for them to get access to medical resources and support services like personal care assistance that they need uh, to live independently and you know to kind of quite literally to get out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. in order to get ready for work and because there are asset caps on eligibility for that, uh, it really places limits on people with disabilities aspirations to competitive employment because by virtue of securing your dream job, you may be disqualifying yourself financially for okay. the eligibility for the very services you need 
to live independently and to buy those uh, those services in the marketplace are it is untenable. Sure. They're just too costly, um, and so trying to find um, a rational uh, disability benefits policy that supports people's independence and competitive employment opportunities, as a ser as opposed to serving as disincentives to working, is a focus of uh, a, s a major focus of the modern disability rights movement. I think what we're also hearing, particularly from our alumni, is housing also. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly here on Long Island, there's a real lack of affordable housing, which we're mm -hmm, hearing, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the disability community. Absolutely. Or also housing opportunities that where they can have some push-in services, you mm -hmm. know, where they might need a little bit of assistance, but for the most part can live independently. And then also in the digital space, whether it's, you know, accessibility to websites, documents, videos, mm -hmm. et cetera. I mean, the internet and the digital world has infiltrated every aspect of our lives sure. now. So it's just ensuring, you know, that people within the disability community have equal access, whether it's applying for jobs to make sure that job applications are accessible or, um, onboarding of an employee, mm -hmm. you know, that they can, you know, get involved with all of the activities that are a part of that, et cetera. And we're really proud of our leading edge efforts around digital accessibility services, uh, making sure that um, the digital divide is not present mm -hmm. for, for people with disabilities. It's incredible work that you're doing here. You. How are you funded? How's the Viscardi Center funded? So we are a publicly funded private school. Okay. Um, so we derive a lot of our funding for the school from uh, state funding. Um, but we also do a lot of uh, fundraising, philanthropy, mm -hmm. and grant writing in order to provide a truly meaningful and holistic um, experience for our students. And when it comes to our programs, uh, through the employment programs through Abilities Incorporated. Um, we have really strong partnerships with state agencies that promote uh, employment and independent living for people with disabilities, uh, notably Access VR, which is a vocational rehabilitation mm -hmm. agency committed to career readiness for people with disabilities, and OPWDD, uh, which promotes independence and work readiness and socialization for people with intellectual disabilities. Wonderful. So what do you want students to know? What, what message do you want to give students who want to maybe become advocates or who mm -hmm. want to work towards um, you know, supporting this, this cause? I think Kim and I both have a lot to say there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let you start this time. <laughs> Um, well, you know, all of your students or any college student, you're the, you're the next leaders. You're the next generation of leaders. You're the next generation of disability rights advocates. So there's certainly something that you can definitely do and go out there and be. And, you know, if you're holding a leadership position and you're in the position to be hiring individuals for your department, your company, make sure you're including, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. candidates that are qualified for those positions that have disabilities. Um, you know, if there's policy work that's going out there and, and our local legislators are calling for support, make sure that you're getting mm -hmm. out there. Make sure you vote. Mm -hmm. That's one of the most mm -hmm. important things mm -hmm. any of Absolutely. us can do in sure. changing policy. Sure. Chris, I no, you can take it, it from there. No, and, and very well said. And just to amplify um, one of Kim's observations, um, by virtue of being students at, at Suffolk, you are poised to become the next generation of leaders mm -hmm. in our community, in Suffolk, on Long Island, throughout New York State, and throughout the nation. And that's uh, just a wonderful uh, aspirational achievement. It's also a humbling responsibility. But as dis decision makers, it's a wonderful opportunity to make sure that your workforces, your leadership teams are truly diverse. And mm -hmm. if they're truly diverse, they must include qualified individuals with disabilities. So when you lead, look around, uh, look around the table and make sure that people with disabilities are included. Thank you. I really want to thank you both for your work and for taking the time to talk with me today and highlight some of these issues for our students. So thank you both. Thank you so Jill. much. Thank you for putting a spotlight on it. Sure.